Last year was the 10th anniversary of Ralph Papakian's death, and I'd intended to write a remembrance of him to mark the occasion, but didn't because I got caught up in working from home and adjusting to life during the pandemic. Once I retired at the beginning of this year, I finally had some time to think and write about Ralph and his influence, and I thank the program committee for letting me share this personal history with you. I was a member of the Midwest chapter for 23 years before I moved to Philadelphia in 2004. Many of you are former colleagues and students and friends, and it's good to be with you again. I got to know Ralph in the 1980s when library technology was going through some transformational changes. Over the course of a few years, we saw the introduction of shared online cataloging, the online public catalog, and electronic mail. And these new technologies changed the way librarians did their work. The early 1980s marked the beginning of a period of technological innovation that continues to this day. I want to talk to you about Ralph's influence on me, influence that many of you also benefited from, and I want to give you a first-hand account of what it was like to live through these changes in the 1980s. And I'll close by reflecting a bit on the equally transformational changes of the past decade, changes that Ralph unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to experience. I was sitting in the library at Indiana University working on a class assignment when I first saw Arson Ralph Papakian. He was standing at the card catalog on the other side of the room and something about him caught my eye. I suppose it was his wiry beard and unkempt black hair. He looked like a young assistant professor and I was puzzled I hadn't seen him around. He extended a sliding shelf from the center of the card catalog pulled a drawer out and set it on the shelf. He looked carefully at one card, then moved to the front of the drawer and started flipping through all the cards using both index fingers, looking only at the ones that for some reason were sticking up above the others. He stopped and grimaced at a card, pulled it out of the drawer, flipped ahead a few cards and reinserted it. Once he'd reached the back of the drawer, he did something I'd never seen. He lifted the round knob on the front of the drawer, pulled out the long metal rod attached to it. The cards that had been sticking out above the others dropped into place, and he replaced the rod. Who was this man? And by what authority was he pulling out drawers, moving cards, and removing rods? I'd moved to Bloomington in fall 1978 to begin a master's program in musicology with a minor in percussion. These were the days before JSTOR and eBooks, so I spent a lot of time in the music library. It was in the basement of Sycamore Hall, a building constructed in 1940 as a women's dormitory. Like nearly all buildings on IU's campus, was made of dreary gray Indiana limestone. Music faculty had offices and former dorm rooms on the upper floors, and the music library was in a cramped Warren-like space in the basement. Pipes in the ceiling burst occasionally and sprayed water on the collection. I was one of four or five students entering the musicology program that year. A required class for all of us was David Fenske's course on music bibliography and research methods. Music reference sources were available only in print, so the core of David's course was a survey of the book shelved in the reference section on the left side of this first room. The class members spent hours at a long table nearby, working their way through the week's assigned reference books. We pulled each volume from the shelf examined it, and took notes. There were assignments that sent us on treasure hunts in search of answers to questions like, what was Joseph Haydn's relationship to a dog named Turk? I was sitting at the long table taking notes on that week's books 
When I watched Ralph and puzzled over who he was and what he was doing, although he wasn't particularly short, he seemed foreshortened. Maybe it was the aura of gravity about him, or maybe it was his broad face with a nose that formed an equilateral triangle when looking straight at him. Over time, I noticed he wore khaki pants year-round with long-sleeved Oxford shirts when it was cool and patterned Columbia short sleeve shirts when it was warm. I never saw him wear a pair of blue jeans, but on the other hand, I never saw him wear a tie. I also learned later that he was Armenian and proud of his heritage. His father, mother, and older brother and sister had emigrated to the United States from Beirut, Lebanon in 1946, two years before he was born. They traveled by boat to the U.S. and settled in Detroit, where Ralph was born in December 1948. Ralph's father was 51 and his mother was 30. The family spoke Armenian at home and Ralph was fluent. He attended Cass Technical High School in Detroit, where he played clarinet and tenor saxophone. Years earlier, other students at Cass Tech included jazz musicians Paul Chambers, Ron Carter, and Alice Coltrane, singer Diana Ross, comedian Lily Tomlin, automaker John DeLorean, and rock musician Jack White. It wasn't until 1980, two years after I first saw him, that I got to know Ralph. I'd finished a master's degree in musicology and was having second thoughts about continuing with the doctorate. I learned about IU's one-year program in music librarianship when a few of my musicology classmates completed it and were able to land jobs soon after. At the center of Indiana's specialization in music librarianship was a spring seminar taught by David Fenske and the four other music librarians. The semester was divided into sections covering broad topics and subsets of the librarians taught each section for a few weeks at a time. David on library administration, Michael Fling and Kathy Talalay on reference services and collection development, and Ralph and Stu, Sue Stanchu on technical services. Ralph was recognized as a leader in the music cataloging community and could have lectured at length about his successful work at Indiana, but he rarely talked about himself. His teaching was Socratic. Class sessions often centered on a cataloging problem he'd found in his work, and he invited us to think through the problem with him. One day he brought in a score selected at random from a new shipment. So, how would you catalog this? We looked at the cover and the title page and threw out some ideas. He thought for a while and said, I think I'd put it in the backlog. At IU, there was always a point in spring semester when academic buildings were too hot. The HVAC systems on campus responded slowly to the rising outside temperature and continued to pump hot air into the buildings as if it were still winter. For our afternoon seminar sessions that spring, Ralph often opened the windows to lower the temperature and increase the chances that we'd all stay awake. One afternoon, a paper airplane flew in through one of the windows. Ralph walked over and picked it up it was made of a piece of notebook paper and decorated in pencil. He started laughing, his punctuated guttural laugh, and brought the airplane back to our circle of chairs. Written on the wings were slogans of mock anger, down with AACR2 on one of them, and no AACR2 in IU libraries on the other. A member of Ralph's staff was behind this prank, and it played on two things, the irksome work of implementing AACR2 and Ralph's political activism. It was early 1981, and the library had just implemented AACR2, which mandated changes to hundreds of name headings, mostly for the better, 
for example, from Tchaikovsky with a C to Tchaikovsky with a T, but some for the worse, for example, from Nutcracker to Chelkunchik. In 1981, most librarians were only dreaming of online catalogs, so the AACR2 heading changes had to be applied to cards. Electric erasers with tips that spun like dentist drills were in heavy use. There were thousands of catalog cards to revise. Most of this tedious work fell to staff and students who often didn't understand the reason behind the changes. So, down with AACR2. The other target of the paper airplane creator's humor was Ralph's political activism. He was outspoken in his political views, which centered on large issues like American intervention in foreign countries, nuclear proliferation, needless wars, disregard for the environment, and unfair labor practices. He, he was concerned less about the individual politicians who come and go, and more about the larger evils that endure. At the start of one of our seminar sessions on cataloging, he asked, so what do you want to talk about? We looked at him blankly. He said, I think we should talk about El Salvador. I'm worried about El Salvador. A few years later, after I'd settled into my first job, I wrote him a letter asking about his interpretation of a marked data element. He scribbled his opinions on the letter and returned it. Across the top, he wrote, did you go to the anti-nuclear march on November 11th in Chicago? I hadn't gone, but he would have. When you entered Sycamore Hall, if you walked past the entrance to the library and continued straight down the corridor, there was a large technical services workroom on the left and the backlog and rare book rooms on the right. The workroom was a large open space with no interior walls or privacy panels, so staff sitting at desks could be seen by everybody. Ralph sat near the center of the room at a small desk covered with papers and books. An IBM Selectric typewriter was on an extension perpendicular to the desk. Sue worked on sound recording cataloging at a desk in the left back corner, and the rest of the non-professional staff were nearby. I learned to catalog sitting in this workroom. Following the seminar on music librarianship, the specialization program concluded with a practicum. Ralph assigned me a stack of scores, and I worked on the description and access points at a table in the corner. Near the end of the day, he called me to his desk, and we reviewed my work, discussing each element, its punctuation, and its coding. It was a slow, careful process. During one of our review sessions, I presented a problem I couldn't resolve through my reading of AACR2 or the Library of Congress's many rule interpretations. We discussed a few possible solutions, then paused to think. Ralph said, in the heat of the cataloging moment, what would you do? I laughed because the idea of heat of heightened emotion, of anxiety-provoking pressure, seemed foreign to Ralph's process. With him, there was no sense of urgency or even a sense of time. Cataloging was an intellectual pursuit that should be allotted as much time as it needed. Carpenters say, measure twice, cut once. And this was Ralph's approach to cataloging. Time and resources are saved if work is done correctly the first time, and if work is worth doing, it's worth doing right. At Indiana, there was one OCLC terminal for use by the entire department, and this terminal was the point of entry for all catalog records. Catalogers did their work on paper, and staff, working in shifts, keyed the data into OCLC using the terminal. For the time being, the data was used to print cards for card catalogs, but there was an expectation that someday the data would drive an online catalog. 